Well, I, maybe back in 2018, shared a message here, uh, and the title was The Hallmark of Heaviness. And I don't want that title to scare you away, but I've been studying some things here recently. The Lord's been stirring my heart about, you know, the days in which we live and the difference between uh, those that will be saved in, in the last days and those that won't. I mean, when you look, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but if you look at the days of Noah, which Jesus said is a pattern for the last days, you can literally put people into two groups, the ones that were in the ark and the ones who weren't. And it's a pattern for the last days as darkness comes on the earth and as floods come. And by the way, a flood represents ungodliness and the enemy. And if you look throughout scripture, you'll see that in the end, there is just a tremendous uh, flood of darkness that comes. And the question is, who will be in the ark and be able and will find deliverance in the midst of all that darkness? But I'm, I'm digressing here. Uh, I want to speak along these same lines about those who have just that carry the burden of the Lord in those very difficult days. Now, in 2003, I was seeking the Lord for a word for that year, and he gave me a glorious word. The word was judgment. And, of course, I don't assume just because I this word came into my spirit that it was the Lord, but there was a confirmation. I know that it was the Lord because Pastor Tucker, uh, who was my pastor at the time, had a similar word, and he spoke uh, at that time, at the beginning of that year, that the curse, that there was a curse that was beginning to come in our land, and he spoke from Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3, where it says, Seek the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgments. Seek righteousness and seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the days, the day of the Lord's anger. And I don't know if you remember, but years ago I had quite a series on these two uh, aspects that are mentioned, uh, meekness and righteousness, those, those that are, are hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Well, the point I want to make is that was 2003. And if God was speaking 20 years ago that, his, that the curse was beginning to come on our land, I would say that, well, it's especially true today. I mean, if you just consider what has happened in our land in the last 20 years, there are, there are things that have happened in this nation and are happening in this nation, and especially in the churches of our nation that I could not even have imagined in 2003. Maybe even couldn't even have imagined in 2013, 10 years ago. And there is no doubt that we are a nation that is, you know, coming in or, or we're set on a path of judgment. In fact, I now say I believe that the judgments of God are already here in this land. When you look at the wickedness that is prevailing, the perversion that's prevailing, that is the judgment of God. God gives people over. There's a point where God says, and if we look in the days of Noah, where it says that God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. We have been created with the capacity to respond to the spirit of the Lord and to sense the spirit of the Lord. But there comes a point when God says, I can no longer strive with man. And that's what we read of in Romans chapter 1. And by the way, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I feel God's in it right now. Uh, in Romans 1, 24, 25, he, he makes this little statement that God gave them over. Because they would not, God gave them over. And that little expression means you go from one control to another. Because they would not accept the control of God, God gave them over to another control. And you see there specifically the thing that they're given over to 
is perversion. And the sense is sexual perversion. And that's what that is what we see is really come into our land, and we know that it's the nation turning away from God because these things are being supported in the legal system. That's the difference. It's not just that men are, are backsliding, but our nation is establishing laws that are contrary to God's spirit. And there comes a point where God says, I cannot always strive with man. Judgment has to come. And we see this in various degrees throughout history, but it comes especially in a great way leading up to the, the, the coming second coming of the Lord. Now, the word of the Lord in times of judgment. Let's consider this. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Amos 3 and verse 7. It says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now, this has always been true, and this will always be true, that when judgment is coming, the Lord gives a warning through his prophets first. Now, judgment is the result of unrepentant sin, and really, God allows judgment to come upon a land because he is waiting, he's being merciful. And sometimes when a person begins to reap what they sow, they'll repent. But when judgment comes, God has waited and mercy is not being extended. Mercy has been expended. The days of mercy are over. But he always, he will not do anything, it says in Amos 3, 7. He will not bring judgment except he first speaks unto his servants, the prophets. In other words, he always gives an opportunity for there to be repentance. And his desire is that all would come to repentance. And, and this is how we understand forbearance. And the forbearance of God is that he bears with sin, sin in people's lives, in order to give opportunity to repent. We forbear when we put up with the sins in people's lives, waiting for God to change them, right? And so we're, we suffer you know, it's similar to long suffering. We suffer with people's shortcomings until the Lord does that work, forbearance. But unfortunately, what we see so often is that, especially on a on a national level, I mean, our example is the nation of Israel, right? They're the old, they are the church of the Old Testament. What we see happen so often in, in Jeremiah 6:17 summarizes this. Jeremiah 6, 17, he says, Also, I sent watchmen over you. Now, spiritually speaking, the ministry of a watchman is the same as it would be in the natural. A watchman is someone who's on top of the wall and can see out and see what dangers are coming towards the city and can give warning to the city. And spiritually, there are those that, that sense what is coming. They can see what is coming and they give warning from the Lord. And those were the prophets. They were the watchmen. And he says here that, you know, I have set watchmen over you, saying, and this is the Lord, this is what he's saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but the sounding of the trumpet is very important in Scripture. Uh, but he says here that the voice of the watchman was like the sounding of the trumpet, and the trumpet was sounded to call a solemn assembly and to seek the Lord. But they said, what? We will not hearken. And unfortunately, that's often what is happening. When God is giving warning, people are refusing to hearken to the Lord, to the voice of the Lord. Now, We'll look further at the response of the people by just considering the days of Noah. I'm going to share at convention just a, a portion of my message is going to be on the days of Noah. And so the Lord has just been stirring Noah in my heart. And remember, as I as I got ahead of myself at the beginning, that, you know, Noah, the days of Noah are a type of the last days, the days before his second coming. And that's Matthew 24, verses 38 and 39. 
And it says, for as in the days, and this is, by the way, he says, you know, as in the days of Noah. And then he says in verse 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, this is speaking of the people of the earth, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, it was life as usual for society, the people that were in the earth. And in general, we could say that they were happy with their everyday life. But it says, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That must have been a terrible situation. We've heard recently of this flood that has happened where tens of, of thousands, probably tens of thousands of people have died, and we've heard the testimonies of some of the survivors in the news. What an awful, awful thing, especially as a survivor, to see, you know, whole families washed away in the flood and to see, you know, the devastation that follows. Well, here is a whole, the, the earth, I mean, we're talking about a worldwide flood. But Noah, for 100 years, had been preaching righteousness. He was the sound of the trumpet. He was the watchman. And yet it says they just went on with life as usual. And, uh, you know, the, the message of Noah, by the way, it wasn't just that I'm building a boat because rain is coming. You better, you better get in it. But, you know, he was preaching righteousness. The scripture says he was a preacher of righteousness. And this is, you know, what the world rejects. When you begin to say, you know, this is wrong. You need to repent. These are the ways of God and this is what is right. Then suddenly, you know, it says of that generation that they were unpersuaded. And we'll, we'll get to that. But, you know, he prophesied of coming judgment. Not just that judgment was coming, but it was judgment because of sin. And sin was going to bring the judgment of God. And it tells us in 1 Peter, it's interesting that Peter would offer clarity about the flood. But he does. And he says in 1 Peter 3.20 that the people who died in the flood, and, and the way that King James says it, is that they were sometime just sometime, not sometimes, sometime disobedient. Now that word sometime means before or at that time, okay? And it doesn't mean sometimes they were disobedient, sometimes they weren't. It was talking about a period of time. So, you know, it's talk, he talks about the flood, and, but before that, the people were disobedient. And this is during the 100 years that Noah is preaching and that Noah is building, and he says in 1 Peter 3.20 that these are the days in which the, the long suffering of God waited, the forbearance of God, he was waiting while Noah was preaching and the ark was being built. And it, it states in Hebrews that these actions of Noah condemned the world because they heard him and they saw him and they had opportunity, and therefore they couldn't say we didn't know. So, you know, what does it mean when it says that they, they had no idea until the flood came? It's just talking about their attitude at the time. I mean, it had been a hundred years. They'd heard it, and they had moved on with their life, but they had no sense of what was right around the corner. It wasn't that they didn't know Noah's message. It was that they were disengaged from Noah. They had set him aside and continued on with their life. So they, they had heard, they knew, but they didn't know that it was going to be today that the floods were going to begin. Now this word disobedience says they were disobedient. It's the Greek word apatheo. Sound like any word? that we're familiar with. There's two Greek words for disobedience in the New Testament. The one is para, parakoi, 
to believe how you say it, but, but that word means to refuse to hear. This is not perichoe. This is apatheo. This word apatheo, which is much like our word apathetic, and by the way, it's, it's a, and in Greek, the a always is negative. It has a negative connotation. So apatheo, and pitheo means to persuade. So that word means not persuaded. They would not believe. They heard the message. They refused to, to even be persuaded by what they were hearing. So that's how we understand this generation. We, we talk about them being sometimes disobedient, but really what this what it says here in Peter is that at that time they refused to be persuaded. They were unresponsive, they were unpersuadable hearers, and of course if you look in Genesis 6, it gives us a lot more insight into Noah's generation, which... I believe is a type of society today. I believe we're in these days before the judgment of God. We're at the end of the church age. But let me summarize what it says in Genesis 6, and I'm just going to give three different verses that make some comments here. But it says, first of all, in verse Genesis 6, 3, this is where God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. Mankind were constantly resisting the divine influence on their heart. And he said, I, I can't always strive with man. His thoughts are always wicked continually. And, uh, and by the way, that's the next point, Genesis 6, 5, that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that this is quite a statement. Every, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So this speaks of a society that had so removed themselves from the influence of God that, their way, that God's ways were completely foreign to them. And this is where we're at. When I was a kid, you could stop someone on the street and say, are you born again? And be like, yeah, yeah, I'm saved. And they would know what you're talking about. People don't even have a concept anymore of these things. I mean, when I was a kid, you ask somebody if they're a Christian, they would want to say, yes, I'm a Christian. I mean, that was the thing that you said. Now people are embarrassed to say, well, yes, I'm a Christian. It, it's just turned. It's so much different today than, than it was. But all the imagination of their hearts all the time, there was no influence of God or godliness anymore in their lives. And then you go down to verse 12, it says, God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, because all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And it's interesting, because man had corrupted, and, it, and this word corrupt, I mean, it, it's, it's just like we would think of the corruption of rust, or mold, or it's decay. They, their, the morals had decayed so that it changed their mode of living. That's what it means that they have corrupted their way before God. And what does it say here? It says the earth was corrupt because man was corrupt. There was a curse that came upon the very land because of the morality or lack of morality of the people. And this is another aspect of the judgments of God. It's more than just judgment on people. It is a curse that literally comes upon a land. And we see changes even in the land. And incidentally, this isn't in my notes, but if you go on to verse 13, it says that, the, that it was violent. That word violent is very interesting. It's not talking about violence as we understand violence. If you look in Deuteronomy 19 and verse 16, it's talking there about a false witness. And what it's saying about that false witness is a false witness who stands up and testifies against someone. So, for example, if I was a false witness and against someone that I didn't like, and maybe I hated them so much that I wanted to see them die, so I set them up. And there's a murder. 
I set them up with false evidence. I, you know, I manipulate the crime scene, whatever, plant evidence. And then I stand up in court and say, it was them or him. He did it. And as a result, that innocent man is hanged, right? Now, a false witness is someone who testifies to see the destruction of the innocent. Now, we read about this in Deuteronomy 19.16, and the word there for that false witness, it's the same word in the Hebrew. It's violence. And so when it's saying that in Noah's day, the earth became violent, it means that there was a testimony against the truth to destroy the innocent. And this is what we're seeing being established in our nation today with these laws and so forth. By the law, Christians are going to be guilty. In God's eyes, they're going to be innocent. It's just like the in Daniel's day, how they tried, the, the princes tried to set him up to destroy him in the lion's den. But the Lord preserved Daniel. And Daniel said, because I was innocent, the Lord shut the mouths of the lions. Very interesting, isn't it? And these are the things that are happening in the earth even today. And we're going, and this is how we're going to see persecution come in. There's going to be a witness, a false witness against the innocent. That was extra. That wasn't in my notes. That's good. But the point I want to make is this, that Noah was willing to bear the shame and the reproach and the scripture says that Noah was a man that walked with God. So he bore the shame and the reproach of being a man who walked with God, who declared what God was saying, who was building a boat on dry land because God told him to. In fact, twice it says in the account that Noah did everything that God told him to do. And it's key because you look at the life of Noah, and this will be my point uh, on Tuesday, that he re represents those that are preserved. And so you look at the attributes of Noah, you have keys into those that will be preserved in the, in the last days. It's interesting, Noah's name has uh, numerical value. I've, I've been looking at the numerology of, of this situation because no, the numbers are very important, especially for the ark. Uh, but this is for free. That if, you, if you hear the message on Tuesday, you can add this to it for greater insight, because I'm not going to talk about this. But there's two numbers associated with Noah. There's the number 10 and the number 8. Now, the number 10 is because Noah was what? Pastor Mark should know this, and I'm going <laughs> to really put him on the spot right now. But he's the 10th generation from Adam. So, I mean, you would really have to be keyed into the generations of Genesis. But he's the 10th generation from Adam. And the number 10 is, is important because it speaks of the end of a cycle. In fact, when you look at our decimal system or our numerical system, we have numbers 1 through 10, right? Then it starts over. So the, the cycle is 1 through 10, and then it goes back to 1. So 10 speaks of the end of a cycle. Now, Noah's generation was the end of that cycle. But... The number eight is also associated with Noah. Noah. How many people were in the ark? Eight people. And Peter specifically said that Noah was the eighth person in the ark. And it's interesting how that's worded because it puts this number eight with Noah. And uh, eight is a, is a very interesting number. I mean, I can't speak of the full complexity of that, but it's the number of regeneration. Like... If you start, let's just consider the days of the week we have, starting with sun, Sunday's the first day, right? All the way through seven. Seven is the Sabbath, was the Sabbath in the Old Testament. But then number eight was what? It's, it's the new week. The eighth day was actually the first day. So there's this correlation between one and eight. Eight is the first, but it's also, and it's greater than seven. It's seven plus one. So the eighth day was greater than the Sabbath. You can actually use numerology to talk about why we, you know, worship on, on Sunday instead of Saturday now. But, you know, this, this number eight, it speaks of regeneration, new beginning. But also, if you look at the, in the Hebrew, the, the gematria of the number eight, which I'm not going to go down that path, uh, 
it, it's the number of superabundance, and it has a connection with oil, the anointing, and, and we actually, the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, this thought of a tent, that word, where the root of that word tent is oil. There, and, and then we think about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. There's a tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit coming, the latter rain. I don't care what they've called revivals in the 50s. They call it latter rain and they got it wrong. And I was confused when I was younger thinking the latter rain already happened in the 50s. No, they just got excited and, and used the wrong Words, there's an outpouring of the Spirit that hasn't happened yet. Pastor Dan just talked about that recently. But, you know, the number eight, it's associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. It's associated with uh, the anointing. Uh, and by the way, Tabernacles, there was two Sabbaths in the Tabernacle. What's interesting about those Sabbaths? It was on the first day and the eighth day were Sabbaths during the Feast of Tabernacles. The number one and the number eight, which are related. Very interesting. Well, I'm stealing my own time by getting off topic, but this is Noah. He was the end of a cycle, but that's not, he wasn't the end because he also has the number eight, which is he was the one that was going to repopulate the earth. And he speaks of those in the last days that will know the tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit, They'll know the salvation of the Lord, and they'll be in the place of safety. Well, let's move along in the message. You know, and the point is that the generation, that generation was corrupt, and they were going to receive judgment, but they had heard the preaching of a righteous man for so long. Now, if we look in <clears throat> Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, he was similar to Noah in this way, and is that he was a prophet. And he was a prophet that was also going to declare the judgment of God that was coming. And so Jeremiah prophesied before the Babylonians came and destroyed Judah and Jerusalem. But he also prophesied during the judgment and during the captivity of Judah. And his message was from the beginning that, you know, it's eminent now. The judgment is coming. But if you'll submit to the judgment, then you'll be properly positioned, you know, to be spared through it. So he was saying, don't resist, but, you know, submit to what God is doing. And to repent. To repent. And there's a point in Jeremiah where he's prophesying, and this is quite a ways into the book, Jeremiah 36. But the Lord instructs him to write on a scroll all uh, of the things that, that God was speaking to him and read it to the people. Now, I think it says a book there, but the book was actually a scroll, so it was a rolled up parchment. As you would read it, you would roll one part onto a scroll and you'd roll it off of the top and you would just read it as you went. Roll it up as you went. We're going to see that this is not what happened to, to Jeremiah's manuscript there. But Jeremiah 36, 3, it may, it, and the Lord says, write this, these, the things that I've prophesied against, you've prophesied against the nation, write them in a book, and read it to the people. In verse Jeremiah 36, 3, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Now, for the sake of time, we'll just jump down to, to verse 21. And Jeremiah did this. He wrote it down on a scroll. So the king Jehoiakim sent Je Jehudi, Jehudi to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elishama, the scribe's chamber, and Jehudai read it in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth, 
until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the heart. Verse 24, yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. And you can sense their flippant attitude as they're just cutting up the words and throwing them in the fire. Now, thankfully, these words are the words of Jeremiah that he wrote down are reserved for us today. So, you know, there was more writing that went on, but just consider what, what they did. And there was just no response. They were not afraid, it says. They could have cared couldn't have cared less. When God declares judgment, there are those who mourn. They hear what God is saying, they understand what's coming. And it's interesting, the ones who mourn when God is speaking, they identify with the ones that are going to receive judgment. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But they they realize how short they have come to God's standard, as, and it can be personal as a person. They can realize how short the church has come, or, or the nation. And they allow the word of the Lord to lead them to repentance. And there's a mourning and a heaviness in their spirit. They are moved by the Spirit of God more than they're moved by the attitude of society, which is going along with life as usual, if we look at Noah's day. And this is what I call the hallmark of heaviness. You know, it's a, it's a hallmark of those who dwell in Zion. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a, an attitude that's in the heart of someone who has a progressive vision, who, who wants to move on with the Lord, who knows the presence of the Lord and is in relationship with the Lord. I mean, Noah walked with God, and the result was he had revelation from God, right? Those that are walking with the Lord have an understanding of what God is doing in the earth. That's what God does. He always speaks before he brings judgment. And this is the hallmark of the remnant that's preserved during judgment. Now, I want to read a verse from Isaiah 33. And this is verses 5 through 7. It says, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. So it's talking about Zion, but listen to what it says. Verse 6, Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Now let's pause for a minute and just consider Noah. We read in Hebrews 11 that it was out of fear, the fear of the Lord, it says Noah moved with fear and built an ark for the saving of his house. And we also know that Noah had the revelation. He had wisdom and knowledge. And so this is very key for us today. What is the key to being preserved or being prepared when God brings judgment? Well, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy time and your salvation. Noah knew what was coming. The people were blissfully ignorant, just going on with life as usual. And why? Because Noah walked with God. He knew the heart of God and was moved by the heart of God. And the fear of the Lord. You say, you understand the statement, the fear of the Lord is his treasure, when you consider that out of the fear of the Lord, Noah built an ark and it saved his family. Oh, the fear of the Lord is such a wonderful gift from him. It saves us. But it goes on to say in verse 7, Behold, their valiant ones cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. So there's this two-fold thing. First of all, there's, there's this wisdom and understanding, the fear of the Lord, but there's this weeping. The ambassadors of peace are weeping because they see the judgments of God in the earth. And as I said earlier, when the floods came, there was these two groups of people. There, there were the ones that were completely unaware, had no revelation from God, 
who are unpersuaded by the message of righteousness and who perished. That's one group. And then there is a remnant who had wisdom and understanding of the times and were willing to bear the reproach of being perfect in their generation. That's what it says about Noah. He was perfect in spite of his generation. Well, I think I'm going to leave out a chunk of my message at this point. I filled him with enough other things. You see that, let me say one sentence. You see this in Ezekiel verses six, chapter 6 through 9 as well. Just summarized five paragraphs. <laughs> okay. But when you look in the Word of God, you, you see this, this hallmark of heaviness in, in the great men of God. Um, Moses and Samuel. By the way, these are all prophetic men. Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah might be the exception on the prophetic part, but they were leaders in their day. And they all, and even Paul, and even Jesus, Jesus looks out over Jerusalem and he weeps. Paul, he said, I have great heaviness and I have continual sorrow in my heart daily. Because Why? Because he was carrying the burden of the churches. And he said, you know, grievous wolves are going to enter in. He, he understood all this. So he had this heaviness. But all these godly men viewed the people to whom they were ministering as a part of their inheritance. This to me is so precious. Because, you know, even the Lord gave Moses an opportunity. He said, Moses, step aside and I'll destroy them. But none of these men had that attitude, save me, who cares what's happened to them. You know, Moses cried out for the Lord to spare the children of Israel. And, and Samuel interceded for the people. And Jeremiah, we just, we see that his heart was broken because of the judgments of the Lord. Daniel, three times a day, looked and prayed towards Jerusalem that the Lord would save his people. Ezekiel, you know, this is the part I skipped, but, you know, the Lord showed him the angels of destruction that were going to come through Jerusalem. And he fell and wept before the Lord. He said, oh, who's even going to be saved? Who's going to be left? You know, he cried out for the people. And we could go through, through all of these men. You know, they had that same, they carried the, they knew the spirit of God. And so they carried the burden of the heart of God. And this is really an attribute of those who are, are, you know, like Noah. They're perfect in their generation. God will use to bring salvation and create a place of refuge for those who will love the truth. You know, we carry this heaviness. If you have the earnest of the Spirit, and I'm using, you know, King James New Testament terminology, if you receive the token of the Spirit when you were born again, if you have even that little bit of the Spirit, God's Spirit within you, you will share the groanings of the Spirit. And part, part of drawing near to God, just like knowing walking with God, is knowing His holiness. And then seeing the world in light of who God is and understanding the judgment of the Lord and the condition of the people. And then, you know, we'll have the same brokenness. You know, the Lord said of the nation of Israel, I am broken. My heart is broken by their whorish heart. He's talking about their idolatry. You know, the heart of God is broken. And we'll have that same brokenness and we'll, will be grieved because of sin. But then there's this truth. Those that mourn because of sin shall experience the comforts of the Lord in the end. You know, Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And it's interesting, Noah's name means he was the man of rest and he was the man of comfort. That's what his name meant. 
Well, Isaiah 61, 3, the Lord will appoint to them that mourn in Zion, give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy, you know, a fresh anointing, a fresh joy in the Lord for in, in exchange for that mourning, the garment of praise. And we've talked about this. Just, you know, people will look and say, oh, look what God has done in exchange for weakness. That, that word heaviness, the, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's weakness. The church, I don't know how you feel about the church right now, but it's like weaker, 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 shame, <clears throat> reproach, weaker. And listen, I want to say this to you. We cannot be discouraged. We cannot look at that. We can't look at that because this is the way it is. There's always a remnant and then there's a great outpouring. We're coming down to the remnant. <laughs> but there's going to be a mighty outpouring. And God's glory is going to be in his people, in the remnant. So we need to be looking for that. And we shouldn't be so discouraged that, oh, it's so difficult these days. Oh, this is so difficult. You just want to be with the right group. You know, you're going to have that the heart. You're going to experience the burden of the heart of God. But remember that there's something glorious coming. You know, I know that the sufferings of this present time are what? Not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I've just been thinking about that little verse, how true it's going to be. And the church is going to know the reality of that verse in the end. Amen.